Green, Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Appeals Court, Brett Diggum, Clinical Professor of Law, Emerita, Columbia Law School, Honorable Andrea Joy Campbell, Attorney General of the Commonwealth, Her Honor, Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll, Commonwealth of the Massachusetts, Her Excellency, excuse me, Governor Maury Haley, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Honorable Robert E. Toon, Jr., Associate Justice, Massachusetts Appeals Court. Please be seated. Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. What a great day this is. We are here, of course, to celebrate the appointment of Justice Robin Toon to the Appeals Court, but I cannot help but recognize that despite the arrival of several new judges in the past several years, this is the first celebration of this type in more than six years. So let's get started. My name is Mark Green and I am, well, for a little while longer at least, the Chief Justice of the Appeals Court. And I am greatly honored that Justice Toon has asked me to serve as Master of Ceremonies for this afternoon's proceedings. Since we haven't done one of these in a while, I may be a little rusty, so please bear with me. Let me start off with the fairly safe part by identifying the speakers who joined me here in the front. Beginning on the left and continuing to the right, we have uh, Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll, Her Excellency Governor Maura Healy, our honoree Robin Toon, Professor Brett Dignam, Columbia Law School, and uh, the Attorney General of the Commonwealth, Andrea Campbell. I also want, and this is the risky part, please forgive me if I miss someone, to recognize some of the special guests who honor us by their presence here today. I see uh, Justice Bessie Duar of the Supreme Judicial Court, uh, retired Supreme Judicial Court Justice Judith Cowan, uh, District Attorney for the Northwestern District, David Sullivan, and Massachusetts Bar Association President Damian Turco. And I also welcome the many of my other current and former colleagues from the appeals court and the trial judges who are here with us in attendance. Of course, none of this would be possible without the hard work of the many people who participated in the selection and screening process that led to Justice Toon's appointment. We're pleased to have with us Governor's Counselor Marilyn Petito Devaney, uh, and Tara Jacobs. I also see uh, Court Administrator Tom Ambrosino and Chief Justice of the Trial Court Heidi Brieger in, in the audience. Um, we are joined by Paige Scott Reed, the Governor's Chief Legal Counsel, along with Jesse Badu, Adam Hornstein, Derek Kesselheim, Gregory Schmidt of her office, Judicial Nominating Commission Vice Chair uh, Mark Fleming, and JNC Commissioner Jerry D'Ambrosio. Uh, of course, did I mention Tyra Jacobs? Yes, I did. Of course, all of you are here today. You are here by reason of your friendship with and support of Justice Toon over the years. Welcome, everyone. Our first speaker is someone who has served as an important teacher and mentor to Justice Toon. Though she most recently taught at Columbia Law School, for today's purposes, it is important to know that she taught at Yale Law School from 1992 to 2010, and while there led the prison legal services, complex federal litigation, and Supreme Court advocacy clinics. She has taught and supervised students working on issues related to poverty and HIV, landlord tenant conflicts, and immigration. It is easy to see how Professor Brett Dignam was an influential figure during Justice Toon's earliest and most formative years of legal study in his understanding of what a career in the law can be. Professor Dignam. Thank you, and I apologize I'm going to read today so that I can actually get through this. Um, it is a pleasure and privilege to mark an important milestone of Robin Toon's impressive, generous, and brilliant career. Today we celebrate someone who has worked tirelessly to ensure that the law lives up to its promise, that it delivers justice and speaks for those whose voices are too seldom heard. Robin has done this as a thoughtful, determined, and excellent lawyer in courtrooms, judicial chambers, 
federal legislative committees, and in the Massachusetts Attorney General's office. Those who appear before him in court will continue to benefit from his fine mind, wisdom, and wonderful way with words. Robbins College classmate Ben Liebman reports that his potential was obvious during an early travel adventure. He had booked tickets for five friends on a train from Kiev to Volkograd. It was so crowded that they could not move or reach their assigned seats. Demonstrating tenacity, creativity, and strategic instinct, Robin vaulted or squeezed through a window onto the station platform where he found a conductor and engineered an upgrade to better conditions, including beds. Robin and I met at the beginning of his second semester at Yale Law School. He was not the fresh-faced football player I had naively assumed he might be. His gentle manner, light, at times sardonic laugh, and sparkling mind were readily apparent. We represented people in federal and state prisons on claims related to their conviction or conditions of confinement. It was a great honor to supervise him and to watch him fly. We inherited an, an ambitious civil rights case that allegedly had compelling facts and asserted extraordinarily novel constitutional claims. Discovery had been cut off twice, and the case was not ready for trial, although a fall date had been set. Robin jumped at the chance to rebuild the case from the ground up. After he had invested more than 200 hours of scorched earth research, counseled the client, and combed through the shards of existing discovery, we were able to out overcome the outrage of opposing counsel and to achieve a favorable settlement. During his final semester at the law school, Robin handled a habeas corpus appeal in the Second Circuit. He transformed a straightforward drug case into a detailed analysis of the evidence and crafted powerful arguments attacking both the erroneous reasonable doubt instruction and the prosecutor's conversion, confusing version of that instruction. The briefs, one of which he wrote while studying for the bar exam and working diligently for the Southern Center for Human Rights, were compelling and elegant. His oral argument was sublime. The legendary Steve Bright, who's in the audience today and generously shared some of these facts with me, hired Robin to work at the Southern Center after graduation for a fraction of the salary he could easily have obtained in private practice. During his five years there, Robin litigated complex class action civil rights cases in the state and federal courts. He appeared before every district court in Alabama and Georgia and argued seven appellate cases before three federal appellate courts. As the architect of innovative lit litigation, he developed the right to counsel. His work established procedures notifying people of their right to counsel and providing them with lawyers. Further litigation required continuous representation from arrest through disposition of a criminal case. These cases led to the creation of a public defender system in Georgia. Few lawyers can claim that level of practice during an entire career. He was five years out of law school. Robin chose a particularly challenging area of the law at a particularly challenging time. When he graduated from the law school in 1995, American prison populations had been skyrocketing for 25 years and would continue to do so for another decade, creating what many describe as mass incarceration. In April 1996, Congress passed a comprehensive statute that created new and daunting requirements for civil cases, challenging conditions of confinement such as defective medical care or sexual abuse. Recognizing that most people challenging prison conditions would not be able to be represented by counsel, Robin not only challenged these new restrictions in various courts, he wrote a book that explained the rules. Protecting Your Health and Safety is a manual for people in prison who desperately need information. 
It explains how to navigate complicated rules and doctrine in a straightforward and accessible format. I used it for years to teach students at both Yale and Columbia Law Schools how to organize their thinking and research. Prison work can be grueling, but Robin found it important and immensely rewarding. Looking closely at our country's carceral forces, policies forces one to reflect on important philosophical questions. Robin thought deeply about these issues. He treated his clients with respect and a dignity that was based on humility and character. In 2000, Ninth Circuit Judge Stephen Reinhardt recruited Robin for an open clerkship. Well known for the bravery and detailed analysis of his decisions, Judge Reinhardt was exceptionally demanding of his clerks. He knew who he had with Robin and leaned on him heavily. His next position was counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee, chaired by Senator Edward Kennedy, where he provided legal and policy advice on issues ranging from crime to oversight of executive branch agencies. He also developed strategy on important legislation, including the long-awaited Prison Rape Elimination Act. A person with these qualities rarely develops them alone. Robin's parents and family clearly laid the foundation by developing the brain, discipline, commitment, character, and integrity that he brings to every project. During his time with Senator Kennedy, Robin married his wonderful life partner, Dr. Hayden Ashby Hushkamp. A professor of healthcare policy and prolific researcher at Harvard Medical School, Hayden is also a force for good. While earning awards for excellent teaching, she focuses her research on issues that are central to our well being. Together, they have raised and learned swiftness from two vibrant and successful young women, Mariah and Findlay. That alone would have been enough. Others will speak about Robin's contributions in the state of Massachusetts. To round out his career in this historic birthplace of revolution and learning is most appropriate. We all look forward to continuing to follow and celebrate what has been a magical and wondrous career. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dignam. As some of you may be wondering about the fact that I've been referring to Justice Toon as Justice Toon since the beginning of the program. We are, after all, here today to witness the formal administration of the oath of office to him that is about to occur. And ordinarily, it is premature to refer to the guest of honor as justice until after that official act has been completed. I guess I should let you in on an open secret. Justice Toon was officially sworn in in early January and is already happily and enthusiastically immersed in our work. Today is, if you will, the church wedding following the quiet civil ceremony <laughs> to allow all of us to celebrate this great occasion in proper fashion. He joins the court at an exciting time of transition. He arrives as we have essentially returned to normal, or at least the new normal, following the disruptions of the pandemic. And he is the first of what will be a number of appointments by our new governor to be followed this summer by three more, including a new chief justice. I am personally disappointed that I won't share more time together with Robin on the court, but I am pleased to have had the opportunity to welcome him and to see him get off to such a promising beginning. Our next speaker is Andrea Joy Campbell, the Attorney General for the Commonwealth and Justice Toon's former boss. General Campbell, I am sorry to have stolen Justice Toon from you, but I trust that your presence here today means that you are willing to forgive us and that you share in our happiness for his uh, achievement. Thank you, Chief Justice, and for your leadership. I was saying, that's good, that's good. And it's not you're stealing them, it's the governor over here. And I'm telling her, <laughs> stop stealing our people. 
um, and Professor, it's a delight, uh, delighted to meet you and thank you, of course, for being here and just for all of your words. I'm also delighted to, of course, be here with our governor and lieutenant governor, other elected officials, including members of the governor's council. Thank you for your leadership as well. It is truly an honor. I, I'm delighted to be here, although I said to Robin when we were doing a farewell in the office that I was sad, of course, to see him leave. But I'm delighted to be here because it is a beautiful an occasion for him and, of course, his incredible family. Congratulations to you, Robin, to your family, to your friends. And I extend that congratulations not just on behalf of myself, but every single person that works in the office. There are too many to name. They're all here, but um, the AGO. Paula's waving, so I'll, I'll, I'll call out Paula because she just waved from the back. Um, but there are too many folks to name, current and past, who are here to support Robin and also extend congratulations to you. As an Associate Justice of the Massachusetts Appeals Court, Robin, of course, will utilize his sound judgment, his deep knowledge of state law to consider and decide an incredible range of criminal and civil cases. Indeed, as you all know, it is no easy task to wade through countless complex issues that present themselves to the appeals court, but I know there is no better person than Robin to handle such matters. As you all know, Justice Toon, Robin, was confirmed unanimously by the Governor's Council. That comes as no surprise in light of Robin's legal expertise, his absolute dedication to public service, and his exceptional personal character. I've had the great privilege of working closely with him at the AG's office, of course, when I took office early last year and until his appointment to the appeals court. During that year and for the eight years that preceded it, Robin served as the chief of the AG's government bureau, where he oversaw nearly 60 attorneys general, working across five different divisions of the office. The Bureau represents the Commonwealth in civil litigation, often relating to the scope of government authority and the propriety of, propriety of government decision making. These are indeed weighty matters. They require thoughtfulness and an understanding of precedent, and not just judicial precedent. They require someone who knows the importance that government plays, but also that government appear to the public and to the courts as taking consistent in considered legal positions. Robin was excellent in considering and crafting those positions. He also was a talented advocate before the SJC and the court in which he now, of course, serves, as well as the First Circuit. He was instrumental in resolving long-running class action litigation to remedy, for example, historic discrimination in police and firefighter, firefighter hiring. He successfully clarified that domestic workers, including au pairs, are subject to Commonwealth's wage and hour laws. Those are just some of the matters that he worked on that are, of course, of great significance to the Commonwealth and to its residents. Just as importantly, Robin was a wonderful colleague, an esteemed and respected member of the AG's office, inspiring others through his grace and collaborative leadership style, and most importantly, probably what I've heard the most, his willingness to take time to mentor younger lawyers and staff so they too could be successful. I know that Robin will bring these skills to the bench where he will certainly thrive in his new role with his colleagues. He will deliver thoughtful and well-reasoned appellate decisions. And I have no doubt he will remain committed to equal justice under the law. And frankly, that's what his career has been about. He's been an advocate, as some of you, and frankly, I guess all of you know now, <laughs> at the Southern Center for Human Rights, counsel, of course, to Senator Kennedy on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And in these roles, he's represented society's most vulnerable and explored legislative solutions to protect them, folks that sometimes people forget about. It's also fair to assume he learned a bit about the law reaching partner at Foley Hoag, which was no easy feat, of course, which is one of the most prestigious firms in the Commonwealth. Robin represents so much that is so good about public service. It takes incredible lawyers to work in this profession, to work in public service, because they are indeed turning down higher salaries and other things, because they care so deeply, not just about the Commonwealth, they care deeply about the people, the next generation of 
leaders in this Commonwealth, and most importantly, doing service on behalf of others. It's not about them. It is about us. And so, Robin, congratulations again. Thank you for your leadership, also your advice and counsel along the way. And congratulations to your family, because none of us does this work by ourselves. So again, thank you for everything you've done for the AGO. Earlier in the program, I recognized some of the many public officials and dignitaries who are with us today. I'm pleased now to introduce some extra special guests. Justice Toon's wife, Hayden Huskamp, his daughters, Mariah and Finley, and his parents, Donnie and Bob. The joy we all feel for Justice Toon today can barely begin to approach the pride you all feel for your husband, your father, your son. Congratulations to you, and thank you for sharing him with us. Our next speaker needs no introduction, really. Uh, she is well known to all of you, but she was instrumental in the selection that brings us all together. She is a true partner to our governor in all things, and in particular in the selection of judicial candidates of the highest caliber. Ladies and gentlemen, our Lieutenant Governor, Kimberly Driscoll. Good afternoon, everyone. It may be dreary outside, but it is shining sun and brightness in here. And it's truly an honor to be with all of you today to celebrate the swearing in of Robin Toon as an Associate Justice of the Appeals Court. Robin's hearing was actually our first hearing for an Appeals Court nominee in this administration. And I want to thank the Governor's Council for their thoughtful work and their ongoing partnership. The witnesses at Robin's hearing left no doubt about his qualifications, and you've heard about many of them this afternoon. They described him as a brilliant legal mind and also as a valued colleague, trusted advisor, and a caring mentor. They spoke of an attorney dedicated to the nuance and craft of the law, who also possesses a keen sense of fairness and a deep commitment to justice. We heard testimony about those qualities from throughout his distinguished career, from his early work as a civil rights attorney in the South, to his time with Senator Ted Kennedy as counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee, to his law firm experience in Boston, and to his service in the Attorney General's office. It is clear, Robin is the type of person who will excel in the role of judge and who will advance justice in our state. His dedication to the legal craft and his zeal for public service will continue to benefit our legal community. His intellect and deep commitment to fairness will be a great boon to our Commonwealth and all the people of Massachusetts. We truly believe that we are fortunate to have him as a member of the Appeals Court. I want to thank everyone for being here to join us in celebrating his ceremonial swearing in. <laughs> but most assuredly, I want to thank and recognize our governor for her wisdom in making his nomination and her example of committed, collaborative, and inspiring public service. I feel very fortunate that I get to work with you every single day. It truly is an honor and a privilege to be here as part of a team that's bringing candidates like Robin forward. Congratulations, Robin, to you and your family and for the good work you'll do on the Commonwealth's behalf moving forward. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll. I mentioned at the outset that we haven't held one of these celebrations in quite some time. In addition to shaking off the rust, it took some doing to pull this together. Thank you, as always, to everyone involved but especially to Monique Duarte. As Monique can tell you, scheduling posed a bit of a challenge. The governor and lieutenant governor's schedules are, of course, quite full at all times. But fortunately, we were able to find a date that we could squeeze in between the second round and the Sweet 16 of the NCAA <laughs> men's and women's college basketball tournaments. Seriously, though, though many people contributed considerable care and countless hours to the judicial selection process, it is the governor who makes the appointment, and it is she to whom we owe the greatest appreciation for Justice Toon's selection. Thank you, Governor Healy, for this outstanding appointment and for being with us this afternoon.
Well, thank you so much, Chief Justice Green. And thank you, I'll use this opportunity to thank you for your many years of service and leadership of the Massachusetts Appeals Court. Thank you. Thank you to the Lieutenant Governor, to Attorney General Campbell, to Professor Dignam, to the members of the legislature who are here, governors, counselors, district attorneys, I see some clerks and commissioners. Importantly, in addition to Monique, and thank you for all the work you do day in and day out, but to all of the staff of the appeals court, the court officers, thank you for what you do. So many justices are here from the Massachusetts Appeals Court and from some other courts, and it's wonderful uh, to see everyone here. Thank you to the Judicial Nominating Commission as well for your work and the Governor's Office of Legal Counsel. I just want to take a moment to take in and appreciate the hall that we gather in. This is the John Adams Courthouse, and as somebody who practiced law for a good number of years, I have deep respect and deep regard for the work that is done every day in this building, both on behalf of litigants and also the men and women who do the work to advance justice in our Commonwealth. This is a special place. We are a special state. John Adams, the architect of American government, you he see it here. <laughs> he wrote the Massachusetts Constitution, the precursor to the United States Constitution. We understand, and I understand as governor, the importance of our courts and those who serve. And so it is special to be able to return to this building today for this event. It's an honor to say a few words about Robin Toon, who is our administration's first nominee to the Massachusetts Appeals Court. Throughout his distinguished career, Robin has exemplified the very best of what the legal profession can and should be. In working with so many of us who are here today, Robin has proven himself to be, he was, a thoughtful attorney. He was and remains to others, I know, a trusted and collaborative colleague. And always, from the time, I can't say before Yale Law School, but certainly since those days, a true champion of justice. He's an intellectual powerhouse who brings to the court three decades of experience practicing across civil and criminal law. He's brought an open mind and humane values to all of his endeavors. He's committed to fairness and to the rule of law. And he has, as demonstrated, a passion for public service. These qualities make Justice Tune a great judge, one who is an asset to the appeals court and to our state. I want to thank the professor for sharing a little bit about Robin's time at Yale and the work that he did later at the Southern Center for Human Rights, uh, the work around important issues of criminal justice and institutional reform. Um, many have talked about his terrific career, both his clerkships, his work with Senator Kennedy. Um, but I'll tell you, I came to know Robin when I was, I just left uh, big firm practice and joined the Attorney General's office. And Robin was at a big firm, Holy, Foley Hoag, and we were both uh, members of the Boston Bar Association's Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Committee. And I really liked Robin as soon as I met him. And a few years later, I had an opportunity as a newly elected Attorney General to ask Robin to join the Attorney General's office as Chief of the Government Bureau. And in this role, I saw Robin work, manage, and, and work on so many of the thorniest and oftentimes high-profile cases. I also saw him work, those familiar with the Government Bureau, you know there are a lot of cases. A lot of them don't get the headlines. 
but are incredibly important. And Robin, as a leader of that bureau, made sure that all cases, no matter how big or seemingly small, received the same amount of care and attention. That is special, that is important, and I am grateful to the work that Robin did during that time. He also was the first to roll up his sleeves. I'm looking out at this audience here, and some of you are familiar with the work of an office like the Attorney General's Office, particularly the Government Bureau, where you cannot always predict what comes through the door. Nor is it always the case, or ever the case, General Campbell, that you have adequate staff to be able to meet every moment. Robin Toon was the person who, as chief, would take to the desk, close the door, do the research, write the briefs alongside every other attorney and paralegal on a matter. And sometimes he was working alone. I trust and expect that he brings that same level of industry to this new engagement and endeavor. And Robin Toon, it is March Madness, you truly have a team player. I also need to say this. I owe Robin an apology. Back in March of 2020, we started to receive reports of this issue around people getting sick. And in particular, you understand and remember that Massachusetts was a place that was seeing some of the initial wave of what later came to be known as the coronavirus. Robin Bean, the manager that he is, and Robin Bean, a person who spends a lot of time reading about other things other than the law, immediately seized on this, walked into my office and said, we really need to take some steps here and prepare to send people home and send people home for a while. This is gonna be really bad. Now I did not have the wisdom of the moment to recognize it as anything more than something that might last a few days, a couple weeks. Robin, I know, I know it's a thing, but it's gonna be okay. So I'm here today to publicly acknowledge <laughs> and to apologize. No, it's a true story. This is going to happen to you. <laughs> Listen to your people. I'm here today to publicly acknowledge and apologize to Justice Tune that he was right <laughs> and prescient. I know that Justice Toon is committed to the justice system, the judicial process, and a judicial process that works for all. He will serve with distinction and honor for years to come. Robin, Justice Toon, know that I am profoundly grateful. These jobs are hard, and not everyone can do them. And I recognize and respect that that you were willing to step forward in this way when you could have availed yourself of any number of options and career paths, but that you were willing to serve in this capacity as a justice of this most esteemed court. I am humbled to have worked with you and your colleagues, peers, friends gathered here today stand with you and support you as you continue with this important responsibility. And while he's already wearing a robe, we are nevertheless going to publicly swear in Robin Toon. Will you join me? I would really like an oath. You would think by now I've done this enough times but I'm not kidding. I can almost do it, but I don't want to have that moment. Who was that? The Chief Justice, we're not doing that. We're going to do this right. So forgive me. For just a moment. The other thing, it's, um, it never gets old, Justice Toon. I, you, I, I, they teach you when you're really short and you're in public pictures, which I am sometimes, 
um, to stand a little bit in front of the person. <laughs> and you look bigger. So with Robin, I'm always like. <laughs> yeah, this it's, it's not a problem. It's just, yeah. it's just what it is. Got it? We got it? Oh my goodness, cheap. Thank you. Okay. We're going to do this. No. Do you have the other part? No, it's fine. You got it? I love the No, it's, there's three parts to it. Okay. This is quite something. Maybe if somebody can go to my desk, take just this picture, send it to the LG, we'll, we'll just go from there. I actually can do it. I mean, he's already sworn in, I realize. <laughs> 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 It's okay. Jane. She's in law school. This is good. This is good. <laughs> Thank you. Good good work. All right, here we go. All right, awesome. All right. Thank you very much. I ask if you to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I I, Robert Earl Toon Jr. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. To the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And will support the Constitution thereof, so help me God. And will support the Constitution thereof, so help me God. I I, Robert Earl Toon Jr. Do solemnly swear and affirm. Do solemnly swear and affirm that I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties incumbent on me. All the duties incumbent on me. As an associate justice of the Massachusetts Appeals Court. As an associate justice of the Massachusetts Appeals Court. According to the best of my abilities and understanding. According to the best of my abilities and understanding. Agreeably. Agreeably. To the rules and regulations of the Commonwealth. To the rules and regulations of the Commonwealth. And the Constitution. And the Constitution. I. I, Robert Earl Toon Jr., do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. This is, this is kind of an overwhelming moment. Um, I'm so grateful that you are here. Thank you, Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll for your kind words and for nominating me to serve as an Associate Justice on the Appeals Court. Attorney General Campbell, thank you so much for being here and for your very generous remarks. Thank you to the Governor's Council, the Judicial Nominating Commission, the Joint Bar Committee, and the Governor's Legal Office for your critical work in reviewing judicial applications like mine. And thank you so much to Chief Justice Green for so ably hosting this event. Um, the Chief recently announced that he's gonna be retiring at the end of the summer, and I am so fortunate to have been brought into the court during his tenure because of his tremendous insight and encouragement that he's provided me from the day uh, my nomination was announced. He also encouraged me to do this event, which initially seemed terrifying, but now that we're here, um, and so many of our friends, colleagues, and family are here, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share this moment with you all. 
In preparing for this event, Hay and I want to express our deep gratitude to the governor's staff, to the court staff, to the court officers, um, and especially to Meek Duarte, um, for, who has been just so helpful to us and reassuring throughout this whole process. We are very grateful. Thank you all to my new colleagues for warmly welcoming me to the court and for helping me to learn the ropes. I promise you all that one day I will learn the style guide. Um, <laughs> In particular, I want to thank Justice Ariane Vino, uh, who has been my mentor uh, uh, for the past three months and um, has provided wise and patient guidance at all hours and at every day um, as my judicial mentor, and as well as my secretary, Jeannie O'Connor, and my law clerk, Nathaniel Hovland Markowitz, who uh, helped me tremendously during my initial months on the job. I'm so grateful that Professor Brett Dignam is here. It's rare to have the opportunity at this stage to thank the person who set your career path in motion. They used to say of the rock band, the Velvet Underground, that uh, they didn't sell many records, but everyone who bought one went out and started their own band. Um, I don't know how many law students took uh, Brett's prison clinic class at Yale, but an awful lot of them, including me, ended up being prisoner rights lawyers. Um, that's in part because Brett was the model of the lawyer we aspired to be. She taught us that legal representation was both a privilege and a serious responsibility, all the more so when your clients were powerless and disfavored. She taught us how to argue challenging causes in court with conviction and clarity. I still remember her telling me, speak from your diaphragm, not your throat. Um, <laughs> above all else, Brett showed us that it was possible, even essential, to integrate humanity into how we practice law. Unlike some other law professors, there was nothing imperious about Brett. She was generous with praise, even if not fully deserved. She asked about our lives. She shared stories from her life with us. And as we entered the third year of law school and began to think about what came next, Brett encouraged us to keep our focus on the most important question, not what job or clerkship was the most prestigious or paid the most, but rather, what kind of life did we want to lead? Thanks in part to the work of the Supreme Judicial Court's Standing Committee, the issue of well-being in the legal profession has received increased attention. And I look, as I look back, I realize how lucky I am to work with generous and supportive colleagues doing work that I found challenging and meaningful. Just out of law school, I got to work with wonderful colleagues at the Southern Center for Human Rights, including Chris Johnson and Catherine Huffman, who are here today. And we all got to work with Steve Bright, um, who is one of the most influential and fearless advocates for the disadvantaged this country has ever known. Um, Steve actually has a book out now called The Fear of Too Much Justice. Um, I encourage you all to go buy a copy. I can, I can assure you that he will not squander any proceeds on, on nice clothes or a fancy car. Um, <laughs> uh, working with Steve doing civil rights work in Alabama and Georgia and South Carolina was the privilege of a lifetime. I also had the great fortune to work for Senator Kennedy on the Judiciary Committee staff. Even though the issues I handled for him were sometimes unpopular, like prison reform or the treatment of detainees after 9-11, the Senator always pushed me to do more, to see what we could get done. Here in Massachusetts, I had the privilege of working for two attorneys general with great integrity, compassion, and commitment to equal justice. Um, as many of you know, I served as chief at the Government Bureau. That's the part of the office where the highest ideals of the Attorney General sometimes collide with the everyday messiness of our democratic self-government. It's a, it's a fascinating and challenging place to work, and I'm delighted to see so many of my colleagues, former colleagues here today, um, including my friend and successor as Bureau Chief Ann Sturman. Lastly, I want to thank my family. Um, I've now forced my parents, Bob and Donnie Toon, to drive up from Virginia um, with their dogs three times through these events. Um, and while they've been here, we've had them chop our firewood and fix our microwave and do other repairs around the house. They're very handy. Um, they've always provided love and support for me throughout my life, and I'm not going to stop imposing on them now. Um, meeting my wife, Hayden Huskamp, changed my life. We're both transplants to Massachusetts. She grew up in Kentucky, I grew up in Pennsylvania. But as I like to point out to my daughters, they're all commonwealths. Um, <laughs> as a health policy professor and researcher, 
Hayden is far more respected and accomplished in her field than I am in mine. Um, nevertheless, she's generously uh, taken part in all this <laughs> with only limited complaints to me, and those are half-hearted. Everyone knows Hayden knows what an amazing person she is, and I'm lucky beyond words to have her as a partner, friend, and co-parent. Um, at the center of our lives are our daughters, Mariah and Finley. Um, as I'm sure parents here will agree, it's a tough time to be a young person in the United States. Our daughters have faced the challenges of the pandemic, various learning disruptions, um, and much more with courage, idealism, and good humor. They inspire Hayden and me every day. We can't wait to see what they do in the years ahead. I, I have so many lasting memories from my career as a lawyer, but one day I will always remember, I was with Senator Kennedy on the floor of the Senate in July 2004, and he gave an impassioned speech um, against the so-called federal marriage amendment to ban same-sex marriage. At the time, he was the only member of the Senate who affirmatively supported same-sex marriage. He announced that position on the day that the Supreme Judicial Court decided Goodrich. One of the things about the senator was that when he was fired up giving a speech, he would sometimes depart from his prepared remarks. And as an anxious staffer, you never quite knew where he was going. Um, and it didn't always turn out well. Um, but on this day, he looked up from his notes and started speaking movingly about John Adams, the Massachusetts Constitution, and its declaration that all people are born free and equal and have the right of enjoying and defending their lives and liberties. He talked about the role that the Massachusetts courts played in abolishing slavery in the Commonwealth. Then he talked about Goodridge and how proud he was of the justices who reached that decision. He also mentioned that most of those justices were appointed by Republican governors. I think he did that mainly to get a rise out of Senator Santorum, who was on the floor at the same time. Um, but I, I, I was very moved and uh, just, um, uh, I, I could not have dreamed at that point that I would have the opportunity 20 years later to serve as a judge in Massachusetts myself. Um, our constitution demo constitutional democracy is far from perfect. But at its core, it's premised on the notion that we, the people, can and should do better than we've done before to form a more perfect union for the benefit of ourselves and our posterity. And that even from a legacy of oppression and division, we can reconstruct our nation into something fairer and more just. Today, I'm humbled by the opportunity to serve a small but important role in our system of government as an associate justice on the appeals court. With your support, I will do my very best to carry out my oath today, serve the people of the Commonwealth, and ensure equal justice under the law. Thank you all so much for being here. gentlemen, that concludes our program. Thank you all again for joining in our celebration of this important occasion. Justice Toon now invites you all to join him and his family at a reception up these stairs. So, uh, and by the way, if you, uh, if you prefer to use the elevators, they are located on either side in that direction. Um, as we leave uh, the podium, uh, please stand if you are able, remain in place during the uh, procession, and then join us upstairs for the reception. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.